Fantastic Beasts 3 is flopping hard at the box office, and I think I finally know why. First of all, we have all the controversy surrounding the actors and the screenwriter behind the scenes. The fans speak for themselves, and a large portion of the fan base has decided to boycott the project because of Johnny Depp's dismissal from the project, J.K. Rowling's controversies, and Ezra Miller's legal troubles. The compounding of these controversial issues has meant that the movie is basically alienating a core audience that grew up with the source material. But that in and of itself is an issue. This franchise is trying to live up to an iconic book and movie series in Harry Potter. And trust me, in the beginning, it had a lot going for it. The main value proposition of this entire franchise was the exploration of the magical creatures that governed the wizarding world of Harry Potter. And that is exactly what made the first movie so damn good. You had great effects, standout performances, and the exploration of a new area of Harry Potter that was basically just a side piece. We had true insight into what the mystical creatures of Harry Potter could bring to the table. From the small creatures to the larger-than-life monsters, you felt connected to a larger world that was just more than the halls of Hogwarts or the ministries of magic in New York and London. What we're getting from this installment, however, is mostly predicated on the political turmoil that was preceding World War II, which, in the Wizards' case, is the selection of the new leader for the International Confederation of Wizards. Again, at this point, you should know spoilers ahead. The Wizarding World apparently chooses its new leader using the judgment of the Chitlin. This being a beautiful, pure, horse-like creature that looks into your soul and recognizes if you are pure of heart. Just like Buckbeak, it'll bow in front of you if it feels that you can have a connection, a pure-hearted connection with it. And then we get into the, all the nitty-gritty details of how Grindelwald is basically basically trying to cheat the system. He's not pure of heart, so he has to basically kill a chitling and reanimate it in order to convince the wizarding world that he's actually worthy of the post. Dumbledore can't do anything about it, even though he's the only wizard capable of stopping him because he's got a blood pack. With that being said, I understand the story of the franchise has to evolve, but honestly, only one of the three projects so far has truly embraced its namesake. These are two separate visions for two separate series of projects jumbled together. To keep it a stack with you, the inconsistent story choices and the lack of a cohesive vision has truly destroyed the potential of this franchise. Something to remember is that this is a five movie project and the last two films are not green lit yet. And according to the studio, Warner Brothers, the fourth movie is going to be predicated on the financial and critical success of this one. I just took a look at the numbers and it ain't looking good, which is a shame because I was really, really excited to see how this universe could flourish. The Secrets of Dumbledore now officially has the worst opening in the entire franchise, only grossing around $6 million opening night. But despite reaching over $150 million overseas, the Secrets of Dumbledore is running 38% behind the second movie and 42% off the original in terms of box office expectations. And the thing is, there's not a singular person to blame because the quality in and of itself is still there. The addition of Matt Mickelson into the cast was amazingly positive, even though it was rooted in a need to avoid bad press associated with Johnny Depp and his very public case with Amber Heard. Speaking of that, there's been a lot of coverage over the past couple of days regarding that case. A lot of the fans that are watching the live taping of that case said that Johnny Depp was dismissed from this project unjustly, and they're demanding apologies from Warner Brothers and Disney for sullying this man's reputation. That is one of the big factors, but it is not the sole reason for the financial lackluster performance of this film. Again, I'm here to review the actual project, not to tell you what to do with your money. I'm just saying that the movie has some highlights that are worthy of being recognized. The chemistry between Matt Mickelson and Jude Law exploring the relationship and love affair between Dumbledore and Grindelwald was the emotional linchpin of the entire project. It is a love story riddled with political drama, but I digress. The other issue that we have is the constant battle of J.K. Rowling considering that she's the sole screenwriter. J.K. Rowling, who wrote the Harry Potter book series, is the only screenwriter for Fantastic Beasts 3, and she's been repeatedly criticized by the media for her controversial statements regarding gender, especially her remarks regarding the LGBTQ plus community. On top of that, we have another prominent actor in the series, Ezra Miller, who's been having a lot of legal trouble in the past coming days with his arrests. This absolute mountain of bad press coupled with dwindling box office numbers and lackluster reviews are not a solid indication for Warner Brothers that the fourth film is worth making. It's an unfortunate, sad reality, but that's where we're at right now. Besides Dumbledore and Grindelwald, Eddie Redmayne does a solid job as Newt Scamander once again. But essentially, he's become a plot device for which the story to move forward, not exactly the center of the entire ordeal. He's not the center of the story, and neither are his creatures. Jacob and Queenie's relationship, however, was a benchmark for the series. A relationship between a muggle and a wizard that's supposed to be forbidden. I was actually really excited to see how that was explored a little bit further, but it takes a back burner to kind of highlight the political drama. We do get a nice payoff in the end because yes, they do get married in this one. Queenie renounces her allegiance to Grindelwald, but it's mostly on the back of Dan Fogler's amazing performance and super great comedic timing. Both of them give sympathetic performances, but it's just way too little and too late. I don't think Alison Sudol, who plays Queenie, was given enough room to truly explore the full breadth of her character. I'd love to see this relationship flourish, but... I don't think we're going to. Besides that, nothing really stood out to me. It was kind of disappointing. It's not bad by any means, but we're essentially assembling a ragtag group of wizards and muggles to try to fight Grindelwald, a larger-than-life figure 
in the prelude to the World War II, which we know is eventually going to happen. Uh, it's essentially Order of the Phoenix, but with a twist. I wanted to see a little bit more of a connection, an emotional connection between the characters themselves. Their relationships and their connections to the mythical creatures should be the central point for the franchise. But of course, Politics. With that said, the newest addition to the cast is Jessica Williams, playing the role of Eulalie Hicks, and she is actually a shining moment for the film. Her abilities and defensive magical skills make her a force to be reckoned with, and I was pleasantly entertained by her badassery. But again, too little too late in a predictable end that doesn't really leave that much room to go in terms of setting up the rest of the franchise. Overall, I don't think the movie was bad, I found it at least enjoyable, and I was hooked all the way through, but in a best case scenario, it's a 6 or a 7 out of 10. This what-if narrative of the political undertones of world World War II and how that they can construct that with a wizarding war is interesting, but I wanted to see magical creatures. That's just it. But again, these are just my takes, so let me know what you think in the comments down below. And of course, remember to subscribe to this channel with the notification bell on if you want more reviews on everything pop culture. As always, make sure to crack a smile, just ride the wave, and I'll see you on the next one. Bleh.